Feel free to follow me on Instagram and Twitter down below. It's there. Perrin Barra, when we are first introduced to him, is a very simple man. It's made clear from the beginning that there are things that he wants in life, and that's just to be a blacksmith in the small village, have to be a simple family, nothing too exciting. That's a very respectable start to a character, just a guy who wants to live a normal life. That is quickly taken away from him. First thing we are told about Perrin, or one of the first things, is that he is not the brightest tool in the shed, maybe. He really likes to think things through before he talks. And while I don't think Perrin is dumb by any means, I think it's his internal insecurities that prevent him from really getting his ideas out, and he kind of overthinks everything to the point where he just kind of seems unintelligent. He's not unintelligent. He's just kind of preventing himself from being intelligent a lot of the time. When he does leave the two rivers, he is still pretty determined to go back, I think the longest of anyone from the party, and he does eventually come back. The character development between when he leaves and when he comes back for Perrin is not very internal, it's more external. His development of his whole wolfy bit is a big character change, but it's not really a personal one. Fayil being someone who he's clearly going to end up with by the time he comes back to the two rivers uh, is again pretty external change. All we really get between that time is a flushing out of his character. What we are introduced to is a very brave man who is willing to put his life on the line for those around him, as almost everyone in the party is. He does not want a super exciting over-the-top, maybe even violent life. He just wants to live as a humble blacksmith. There's some a very interesting choice that happens with Perrin's character. Before he comes back to the Two Rivers, he gets to work a blacksmith's forge once again. Uh, he kind of has a very zen evening of just working this forge with a master blacksmith. This was a very deliberate signaling for me. I knew something drastic was going to be happening to Perrin's character as that forging was happening. To me, it was a signal from the author to get ready. While we're giving this guy one last kind of break, things are going to go downhill. And man, do they go downhill. Perrin learns that the White Cloaks have invaded the two rivers, there are Trollocs attacks, and all kinds of things like that. And he knows that the White Cloaks are looking for him because of his killing of a few White Cloaks. So as we all know, he goes there to go turn himself in and be hung by White Cloaks. He gets there, he quickly learns this is not possible because the White Cloaks are protecting the village from Trolloc attacks and the Trollocs have murdered his entire family. When Perrin learns this, again, this is kind of the beginning of that change that to me that forging signaled that Perrin is going to be broken down and rebuilt. That rebuilding goes through a few stages. He kind of goes through quick cycles of development that take someone like Rand the entire series. So let's look at him as he is right now after learning his family is dead. Perrin is a very insecure man who is very afraid of a lot of the things happening inside of him, especially regarding the wolves. He knows he can be a competent leader, but he's very hesitant to take charge. In fact, he even starts giving orders at some point to people who he grew up around and then immediately apologizes. Those people then say, no, you're doing a great job. Keep going. Uh, this is pretty much the first step for Perrin. After he gets over that morning, he starts kind of coming into his own, but still filled with those insecurities. We then get a look at what happens when this new Perrin is confronted with direct conflict. And that's when we kind of get glimpses of what Perrin's potential is. Every time Perrin is confronted with either direct violence or opposition to what he thinks should be done that he knows is absolutely wrong, you get a much more confident, concise, and vocal man. Something very different than that shy blacksmith we met in the eye of the world. This is where the character Lord Luke comes in. Lord Luke is someone who's trying to subtly sabotage the Two Rivers' defenses and have the Trollocs be able to keep doing what they're doing. Perrin knows Lord Luke is making the wrong decisions, and there is a pretty direct ideological confrontation between the two and indirect as Perrin starts convincing these families to come back, and Lord Luke is definitely the one who's not wanting that to happen. There's a dramatic moment of Perrin going, you can regrow a crop, and then pointing at a child, and going, you can't regrow that, which is a good point. Perrin is quickly becoming someone that everyone in the village respects, and Lord Perrin is now being developed. As time goes on and these situations get more and more drastic and Perrin gets real allies behind his back, like Tam and Matt's dad, uh, we see a man who is actually willing to take the offense as well. 
he breaks into the White Cloak camp and frees Matt's family. He's able to organize the Two Rivers into a defensive force of their own, and this kind of gradual development is even more emphasized with him having direct conflicts with some Aes Sedai that are also in the town. He's not really yelling or screaming or fighting with them, but he's just able to tell them, no, this is what's going to happen and what I'm going to do, which with the status of Aes Sedai in this world and what Perrin used to be compared to what he's turning into, it's pretty dramatic. There are moments where he's still kind of venting his insecurities to fight who's now his wife at this point, and she's the one who really tells him, like, no, you're doing great, keep it up. The only thing Perrin at this point seems unable to conquer as an internal struggle is his fear of the wolves within him, which is very understandable. This is something that is not exactly human. The whole wolfy side is not something that I don't think anyone could easily come to terms with. I think a moment or from earlier in the series continues to haunt him, and that's when he sees a man who was taken by the wolves and thinks he is a wolf, and Perrin's very afraid of this being his future which it's not subtle that that's what is really freaking out Perrin. He mentions it many times. I like the continual going back to that encounter as being something that hangs like a shadow over Perrin because it kind of conflicts with the love he has for Hopper, who is a wolf, a wolf he loved that died. Uh, and he's able to still interact with in the dream world. Hopper is kind of the polar opposite of that fear because there's a lot of love towards some wolves and a lot of this hesitation and it's about finding this balance, and he's not there yet, and he does not get to there till way later in the series, long after he's left the Two Rivers. By the time the conflict in the Two Rivers really comes to a head, Perrin and Lord Luke, or Hunter, have a showdown in the dream world, where Perrin is able to not kill, but defeat this man, who in my opinion represents all those internal struggles within him, and Lord Luke has to flee the Two Rivers. To me, this was a brilliant foreshadowing that no, Perrin hasn't killed his insecurities or internal conflict, Conflict, but he's certainly taken the right steps to move forward as a character and become more of the legend that we can see he's going to be. I want to take a moment to talk about the fact that Perrin becomes someone that everyone respects, even those who are not from his culture, like Aiel, kind of identify what Perrin is and start showing him lots of respect. And that's just due to him being a simplistic man, not in a negative way, just in a, here are my goals, here's what I think is right, and here's how I'm going to go at them. There's almost never ulterior motives or backstabbing or anything like that to Perrin. He just is going to take one step at a time to get where he needs to be. And everyone kind of trusts him and likes being around him because of that. And I, I think that's reflected in the fact that the Aiel start respecting him quite a bit. After the conflict in the Two Rivers ends, Perrin actually gets a bit of a reprieve. He and Fael kind of even have a small home for them built in the Two Rivers, and they stay there for a good amount of time. Perrin is called away, though, by Rand tugging on him through the pattern, and he knows he must go to him. From here, the new Perrin has some problems with Rand. Rand has changed quite a bit since Perrin last interacted with him, and there's some conflict between the two. After Perrin rescues Rand at Dumai's Wells and sees the level of destruction and power at Rand's disposal, Perrin's really hesitant to let Rand continue keeping the Aes Sedai under the Wise One's custody. Uh, and there's real conflict between the two that comes to a head in a massive fight. Finally, Perrin is sent off to go get the Prophet and bring him back. It's said that some of this conflict might have been planned so that Perrin could go off and do this without people knowing, but at the same time, it's also stated that this kind of stage conflict went way further than it was supposed to because there is real tension and I mean, a little bit of resentment between the two. Now a bit of time begins with Perrin that I'm not a big fan of. A bit of time where Perrin goes off to get the Prophet, his wife is taken, he joins up with a bunch of armies to go get his wife back from the Shido who've taken her, and Perrin's entire character just becomes, I must save Fael, I must save Fael. This is not really a very interesting time for Perrin. He develops in some ways, and he has some amazing moments during this multiple book period, but this chunk of the series is known even among the biggest fans as the lull. We see Perrin do things that we certainly didn't think he'd be capable of, like chop a man's hand off before even asking him questions to try and break him and get information out of him, which works. Uh, this is a very intense scene where Perrin basically threatens to cut off the man's hands, feet, his eyes, and his tongue, so he'll be a blind, mute, handsless, feetless beggar. And of course, because this is an Aiel, holy crap, it works, and Perrin just kind of wants nothing more than to get his wife back. And he does, and that's pretty much everything that needs to happen with his character for quite some time. Then he kind of returns to the Perrin he was before this with some slightly darker tinges. I'm not a fan of this bit for Perrin, and it's kind of what knocks him down a few pegs in order of ranking of my favorite characters. If you're going to have a three-book 
period where your just entire motivation is one thing. I, I get why he'd want this one thing, but it just shouldn't have been three books in my mind. What really is emphasized during this time is Perrin's conflict between the axe and the hammer. Does he want to embrace the axe and become this warrior king, or does he want to embrace the hammer? The resolution to this, to me, is pretty beautiful, but first we have to talk about the trial. Another thing that I really, really hate. It's a great concept, just very poorly executed. Perrin is finally confronted by the White Cloaks, now led by Galad, and of course Galad recognizes his mother Morghese, who is working for Perrin. Everything kind of comes to a head in this trial, where the dialogue is so stupid, and someone should have just clearly explained what happened, why no one did, I'll never understand, just, hey, this is what happened, oh, okay, that makes sense, over. But instead, Perrin makes himself seem way more guilty, and all this kinds of stuff, he needs to be. He thinks he's kind of kneeling to justice in a way that doesn't fit his character. Perrin's not the kind of person in my mind who would go, oh, the White Cloaks need their justice and this is their version of it, so okay. He would just go, I can talk to wolves. Wolves are sentient beings. You murdered one. I have defended myself and my friends who had been wrongfully taken prisoner. End of it. I was justified. Over. But no, apparently Perrin cares about what White Cloak justice is for some reason. I'm sure I'm going to get some comments explaining why he did this down below, but in my opinion it was just wrong and it didn't fit his character. Then we get Perrin's redemption with the White Cloaks where he saves them and Galad basically starts worshipping Perrin because Perrin embodies everything Galad wants at this point. A simplistic man who's able to achieve greatness by just straightforward action and following what he believes is right. Perrin is now really ready for the last battle, and he's had his final forging. Perrin forges a power wrought hammer axe hybrid as basically it's Mjolnir, and it's his super powered hammer that allows him to just obliterate people in his path. During the last battle, Perrin finds Slayer and completely and utterly destroys him, finally signaling that Perrin has conquered the Wolf King inside of him, and he now is fully the man and legend that he should be. And a side note, arguably the most powerful character in the entire Wheel of Time, because he can jump in and out of the dream world and bring people into it. And in the dream world, he's God. So, holy crap, but all right. And on another side note, Hopper dies in the dream world for good. They make us live through Hopper dying twice, which is just not fair. Okay, Brandon. You do you. There is one final event with Perrin after the last battle where he needs to find his wife and he believes her dead. Do I think Fael should have died? Um, I didn't love Fael's character. I didn't hate her like some people do. I thought with the buildup of the man that Perrin was and the incredible journey to get where he is, I used to think killing Fael would be the right move, but after thinking about it and doing this examination, with how much Perrin depends on her, he would have been down to broken Perrin again. And I don't, I don't want to see that. I want to see him stay this made man that he was. So I'm very glad she was not killed. And Fael even had a little bit of development throughout this series. I think she should have had more and that would have made her more likable. But I'm glad she did make it through the end. And just having her almost certainly be dead was a bit cheap to me, but I get why they needed that tension, and it was very well executed. So I'm in general very happy with the beginning to the end of Perrin's last battle and Fael's last battle arc. That is my character examination of Perrin Ibarra, the blacksmith who became a dream god. I hope you guys liked it. Uh, please like and subscribe. All that fun stuff. See you soon. Peace.